everyone, my name is Shelby and this is the YouTube series where I reveal what's inside these mystery pottery molds I found on Gumtree. Hello and welcome to part 32 and we've got a small little mold that I've been very cautious with because it actually has a really big title on the top. So I am making sure that I don't reveal that too soon. So to do that, I popped a little rectangular sponge over the top um, and covered it with my hands so that you wouldn't see any spoilers until the actual reveal. So as you can see, it's got two holes on the top. Um, it a littler mold you know what I'd say it's a medium compared to what I've done in this series so far so I pull it up let it set pull off the rubber band and here we go it is a set of love birds so there you go there's that birds that it says it's number four three five review molds um so yeah that I like that this one's got a very clear um label makes it so much easier to find in the studio um, when you're working or looking for a certain piece but i really love this mold it is very detailed very textured um, the expressions of the two little birds is so adorable you'll see it in just a second so first i pull the mold out uh, the piece that i've made from the mold out and i cut those pouring spouts off so that i can start to work with it um, and having a look at the details in it. So I am cleaning them all up, ready for painting and preparing. And you can kind of see here, one of the birds has kind of like tucked its head underneath the other bird's beak. And it's quite adorable, um, very gorgeous. And I had flashbacks to the lovebirds that accidentally happened in another reveal um, when they fell into each other. So this week I am doing something a little bit different. Um, I'm not using, I guess, like a detailed underglaze illustrative work like I usually do um, is how I would explain it is um, it's actually there's this is for a number of reasons. I'm trying to unpack it, but quite simply, it's freezing here right now. Um, and being outside, I get barely any daylight. My current studio is exposed to all the weather. So trying to paint, you can see how red my fingers are. They're freezing in this shot. Um, so I decided to do some glaze tests on these pieces. Um, I recently bought some new glazes that I wanted to try, some commercial ones from Amico and Chrysanthos, and I want to give them a go and see how they look. And I thought that these birds would be really perfect because they're really little, they're really sculptural, they've got lots of indents and crevices. Um, so that makes it perfect to sort of see how a glaze will move and flow over different surfaces. So that's why I decided to do that this week is because A, I'm a wuss, and it's very cold and B because I wanted to test some glazes that I just got anyway. So what I decided to do with these pieces is sometimes with the glazes the color doesn't really nestle into those indents as much as I want them to so I decided to antique these pieces. I've done it before with uh, an earlier mold where I did it after the fact so I painted it and then antiqued it and had the detail inside all the crevices but this mold I've done it first because I wanted to be able to sponge away the underglaze because this is underglaze that I'm using here and then put the glaze over the top and then if it's light on the glaze you should be able to see just those little pops of brown that are it's just enough so you can see the texture um, yeah there's a lot of reasons why I decided to do it this week is because I don't know what these glazes are gonna do um, that's a number one reason um, the other reason is it's nice to still get some texture out because I don't know how thick the glaze will finish in the kiln I sometimes when it's um, a really thick glaze you lose a lot of that texture that you've sculptured into pieces so that's another reason is so you can still see those beautiful feather details because it would be just such a shame to lose those in the process um, yeah so I've done birds before so this is the second lot of birds from the molds the other ones were two birds but they were uh, by themselves and for those I did a really beautiful sort of folklore uh, folk art inspired piece um, so these ones are sort of really stripping back this uh, the bird concept and going with another idea that I nearly did for them and just doing a plain glaze color and just seeing how it nestles into the feathers like I've been talking about 
I find the antiquing process so satisfying. Um, watching myself paint this back and sponge away the excess to reveal the detail on these pieces just makes them come to life. Like they feel like they were missing it this whole time and they just needed that extra detail. Um, so I'm really hoping that you can still sort of see that with the glazes, but I also want the glazes to speak for themselves. I don't often use glazes um, by themselves in my work. I do it more so in this small series. I have a deep fascination with glazes, but it's just never, I guess, come about in my work is because I wanted to get a very controlled, detailed piece of illustrative um, color on my pieces. And that's really easily achievable by underglaze and one of its biggest pro. Um, with glazes, the thing that draws me to them is that they are absolutely magical um, from what they look like when you apply them to how they come out after the firing. It can be a completely different transformation. And like handmade pieces, no two glaze firings are going to be the same. Like the different reactions are going to appear in different spots on every single piece. And I think that this is why I am so addicted to pottery because no matter how much detail I can put in a piece, it's always going to turn out so different and so unique. And it's going to make me want to keep every single one. Um, so I'm, I know that it might be disappointing for some people knowing that I'm not going to be doing the underglaze because I know that a lot of people like seeing the different ideas and concepts I come up with in the color. But for me, this is really exciting this week because I get to try out some new colors that I've never tried before. I have no idea how they're going to react in my kiln, how they're going to react on this piece, how it's going to show up with that antiquing underneath it's just all really exciting for me like really exciting so um if you can appreciate that little side of glazing um i think you will like this week's reveal um even if the the colors don't come out as good as i was expecting or hoping or anticipating so for the antiquing, I had to bisque fire the underglaze on. Um, you don't have to do this. I just did this because I find it just helps settle that in place and it doesn't move and merge when I'm brushing on glaze because I'm using brush on glaze. If you brush on on top of underglaze, it can actually smudge your underglaze detail. Um, so I bisque fired that on and I just was so cold. I was holding on to the things coming out of the kiln because there was a massive storm rolling over. These were the gum trees out the front of my studio. It was freezing and I started glazing and even my camera was struggling. You can see here, most of my footage was so foggy. I had to keep pulling my lens off my camera because it was just fogging up instantly. I couldn't see what I was filming the whole time because even like the little screen on my camera was fogged up like I, it was just really cold um and one of the downfalls of pottery for me in the winter is I cannot handle the cold I I like I said before I'm I'm really wussy with the cold I love the heat I I absolutely adore it I low like I I'm like a lizard I love it um but with the cold I was just oh I was just not having a good time and neither was my camera so I'm so glad I opted to do the glaze test this week because I don't think I would have handled sitting there and individually painting every feather on these ones so here I am opening up some new tubs just to show you that they are officially new tests I'm not um, making this up and I made sure you probably saw just before I sponged down the bases to make sure that there was no excess glaze uh, or little splatters but I also added a little underglaze registration mark so I could remember which glaze test was for what. Um, so just doing a little dot underneath my signature on the bottom. I do that because it might seem really obvious what each test is going to be but sometimes the magic of the kiln I forget um, or I don't remember which one was which because sometimes like this one's a really like gray color it could come out totally wild and totally different and very similar to something that was a red color just for example i've never had that happen but that's just an example of how like diverse the transformations can be that two colors that went on different can almost look the same so that's why i've done those little registration marks um after these i'll probably do some test tiles i do keep 
sample tiles but I was just like I'm just gonna test this on a whole piece because sometimes the test tiles you do so they're like little um they can be little circles or little squares that you just do that you put like a little swatch of color and you can have it there permanently so you can refer to it um, and use it and I've shown my test tiles a few times with my under glazes on the YouTube um, not my glazes though I don't think um, but I will make test tiles for these glazes regardless I just thought sometimes it's just good to see it all over a piece because sometimes on the test tile it's not as accurate as what it's going to look like flowing and moving over a sculptural piece so another thing I was meant to mention before, but then uh, my footage didn't really line up for me to talk about it, uh, was that this piece went through three firings. And that's for um, a number of reasons. The first one, um, I bisque fired it because when I antique, I'm really rough with the sponge. And I wanted to make sure that I was getting it in all the underglaze in the crevices. And then when I'm sponging it away, I'm only sponging away the underglaze and I'm not sponging away the detail in the piece. Because before you bisque fire it, it's still greenware, so it's still soft clay. The, the water in the sponge can move the clay around a bit and you lose some of that detail. So that's the first. I bisque fired it first. I then bisque fired it again after applying that um, antiquing detail. So that was so that I could lock the underglaze in place and it doesn't merge and move when I'm brushing on the glaze. And then the third and final firing is the glaze fire. So that's to the highest temperature I go um, and that's to pretty much transform the glaze and transform this pottery to vitrified ceramic. So into the kiln they go. I am very excited this week because I decided to do something a little bit different. Because it's a glaze test week, I decided to do like a before and after on my little bending wheel. So of each sort of section of the bird to show you how much it transforms. Because sometimes you kind of forget what it looked like before. I don't really show it off too much. But let's get into it. This is before and then this is after the kiln firing. The colors transform and change so much. Um, obviously there's a bit of the resemblance still there with that red color, but you can see that it has been quite a transformation. It's got a lot more of a uh, warmth to it. It's a lot more darker. And also you've got those pops of the white sandy color coming through. I am so glad with all of these that I did put that under glaze in the feather details because I feel like these pieces would have felt so much different if it didn't. You can see here that it adds so much depth. With this one, this one looks quite white before it went into the kiln. But when it came out, it is absolutely beautiful. It's got a lovely soft green undertone, but then it's got this beautiful mesmerizing blue. It's almost speckled in detail, um, like really, really speckled. I don't know whether that makes sense, but it's really, really gorgeous how um, in the thicker areas it's come out quite blue. And just to remind you before, I've only done one coat and it's quite a thick coat on these but I've only done one coat just to see what it looks like uh, for something like this I'd probably do two coats um, just to get a bit more blue but these are just <laughs> it's really stunning and I'm so glad again with that under glaze you can see all those feather details and the glaze just works in a really mysterious magical way that sort of brings them to life um, in ways that you can't really achieve with underglaze because underglaze is such precision it's such a uh, yeah precise and controlled medium compared to a glaze where you don't know where the colors and details are going to come out so this one was my favorite it's quite an antique traditional looking uh, glaze but I love the warmth I love the spotted um, mottled is that the word um, kind of effect that this has and the different texture it adds it's quite smooth to touch as well so this one came out really really gorgeous and I'm really impressed with that color and we'll definitely use that again the last one was the mustard. Um, I got yellow because I love working with yellow in my underglaze work. So, and I don't have a yellow glaze. So this one was quite lovely. It's got a very 70s patina. The brown has almost gone to a black with that um, yellow on that. And that's ma mainly because I guess like yellow is quite a bright color and anything darker than that always sort of comes out a lot darker than what you expect. But I still love the look of this. I think each one sort of has its own beauty. 
But otherwise, I'm really impressed with these. I'm so glad I used these for a glaze test because they are a perfect piece just with the way they're so sculptural. They've got lots of divots and rivets for things to the glaze to settle in. So because they reminded me so much of little forest lovebirds, I took them out to bushlands near me and these ones actually have a lot of pine trees which aren't native to Australia um, but I've got some beautiful mushies, toadstools um, and moss and lichen that I could take the photos and some videos of them in the wild. The colours all matched up so perfectly. Who knew that I got inspired by the mushroom I just showed? It was so stunning that all the colours on these birds were representative in the mushroom. But I hope you like this reveal. Make sure to like and subscribe for part 33.